The Utah Utes are taking their Week 2 matchup against Baylor as one of the most important games of the whole season. We'll tell you why on Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up Bears fans? Welcome to another episode of Locked On Baylor brought to you by Game Time. I am your host Cam Stewart of ESPN Central Texas and the Cam Show on Rogue Media Sports Network. Thank you so much for making it your first listen today and every day. And today is the maiden voyage of our Big 12 season preview where we're going to take you through all the Big 12 opponents that Baylor is going to face in this 2024 schedule, which will include, yes, Utah, even though that is a non-conference game. Week two out in Salt Lake City, the Bears will take on the Utes. We got my good friend JT Wistersill of Locked On Utes coming on in just a minute here, and we're going to talk about why Utah is one of the favorites in this conference. He's going to get very candid about that schedule and just how easy it is. And yes, why that Baylor game is so important. We know why it's important from a Baylor standpoint, but why are why is Utah taking it so seriously? And might we see former Bears basketball star Caleb Lohner catching some passes out there from Cam Rising as he is now with Utah as well. So without any further ado, how about future me and future JT Wistersill talking to you about the 2024 Utah Utes and what that game in week two is going to mean. JT Wistersill, Locked on Utes, joining the program to preview the what some people are calling the odds-on favorite to win the Big 12, the Utah Utes. So JT, my first question to you as we are looking towards the beginning of this season, we've entered into fall camp. How is life in the Big 12 treating you? I mean, Utah fans are excited. I mean, the schedule, the players that are back for Utah, Kyle Whittingham's potential final season, there's a lot of excitement and hype around this year for Utah. And I think this team has a great chance to win the Big 12 this year. I think they deserved that top spot ranking. I can definitely understand Big 12 fans' frustration for Utah not being there. One thing I had forgotten about until the coaches' poll dropped is that Utah – is the highest ranked team that did not finish last season ranked. I forgot that Utah did fall off a cliff, so they weren't ranked at the end of the season. But why did Utah's fall off a cliff at the end of last season? Injuries. And what was their biggest injury? Cam Rising. When Cam Mm. Rising was healthy, this offense averaged 38 points per game in 2022. That cratered to 23 last season. And this year, you get Cam Rising back. You have Brant Keithy back. He has two 600-yard receiving seasons under his belt. And – Look, in college football, I know Cam Rising, Brant Keithy, those guys are old. Brant's first over 600-yard receiving season was in 2019. So he's been in college a very long time. But experience, we've seen that win out and work, right? Think about Bo Nix, Michael Penix. Those guys dominated yeah. a lot of their opponents last year because of how prolific they were as passers. So when you look at this Utah team, the amount of players that are back because of the COVID rules from even the 2021 Pac-12 championship team is is incredible. So I'm really excited for this season. Utah's got a big target on their back because of yeah. them being picked number one. I know some of the fans have made people mad. I'm sure I've even given some <laughs> takes. Maybe the one I just gave made some people mad. But I am really excited to see if this Utah team can live up to the hype. Yeah, so, okay, you, you outlined it really well there. And two touchdowns a game, that's a, that's a massive difference. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're – Make no mistake. So is it that simple of Cam Rising, who we know is a a tremendous player, but is it that simple in today's quarterback-heavy college football age that not having him goes makes Utah from an unranked team to one that's top 15 and projected to win a major conference? That simple? For me, yes, and I'll explain why. Because this is Kyle Whittingham's Utah football team. Most teams you would be like, let's say Josh Heupel at Tennessee, right? Offensive-minded head coach, they're still going to throw the ball and be aggressive. Kyle Whittingham is a defensive-minded coach. I've watched Kyle over the years literally tank certain offensive possessions because he does not want to risk turning it over. Utah would run the ball on third and nine last year. And that's the reason I'm going bald because I pulled out all of my hair last year <laughs> watching Utah run it on third and nine so many times. But like one of their backup quarterbacks was Nate Johnson. He's going to start at Vanderbilt this year, or maybe start at Vanderbilt this year. Mm. His best attribute was a runner. 
Utah refused to let him run because he had a fumbling problem for a few games. So they were content with, hey, I know we're down by seven right now or like even 14 at one point, but it's like we're going to take the chance and continuing to try to run it and break through. So this Utah offense was just really conservative with their play calling last year. They were not aggressive because Kyle Winningham was like, we do not turn it over. And why was the play calling not aggressive? They didn't trust the quarterback. Kyle Winningham has routinely called Cam Rising, who he more than trusts, one of the best leaders he's ever been around. They are going to let Cam Rising take the reins of this offense. They have recruited Dorian Singer, a former 1,000-yard receiver. Didn't work at USC last year, but two years ago at Arizona, he was on fire. Utah sold him on a vision. They they sold Damian Alford, who was averaged 19 yards per catch at Syracuse before he transferred to Utah. He sold those players on on a vision to come into Salt Lake City to play for this Utah team. Utah's going to be more aggressive this year, and Cam Rising is the difference. Cam Rising is never a quarterback who is going to be all over SportsCenter's top 10 each week. But you know what he does? He delivers in the biggest moments. It's why Utah won back-to-back Pac-12 championships. It's why he went toe-to-toe with Caleb Williams and won. I don't think he was better than Caleb Williams that day, but there were plays that needed to be made in the second half. Cam Rising pretty much always rises to the occasion. And I'm not even trying to make a pun. That was so good, though. That was so good. (laughs) But you look at that. You look at the success this team's had, the defense, and they got their guy back. This offense changes when Cam Rising is under center because the coaches trust him. So you're right. In most cases, it'd be like, is it really realistic for them to get back up there? Most teams, probably not. With Utah, because of how differently I've seen them call a game when they have confidence in their quarterback, Utah would tell you that 100% of the playbook was not being used last year yeah. with Bryson Barnes there. It was with Cam Rising, and it will again this fall. And when Cam has played his full two seasons, and that's all he's actually played. He's only played two full seasons. Incredible. I know he is. Yeah. He's Look, he – First arrived on campus in 2018, but because of injuries and transfers and all that, really only two seasons. When he's played a full season, Utah has been conference champions both times. And I'll, we'll, we can talk about Utah's schedule a little bit more enough, mm, later in this episode if we so. want. I think this schedule really sets them sets them up to be, a, once again, conference champs in their new conference, the Big 12. Yeah, we we will get into the the schedule and why that's not such a cocky statement that you just made. Uh, <laughs> but talking about that quarterback, because I think we – we saw that last year in, in the Baylor Utah game. It was a battle of backups. It was a rock fight, man. I mean, we we're sitting up there thinking, like, how is Utah gonna compete until Camp Rising gets back on the field? And obviously it w- it was a struggle all season. And we really saw a microcosm of that in that um week two game in, in Waco. And looking at that, I, I ask you, because you kind of touched on it a little bit there. What does Utah's offense look like when the playbook is open and Cam Rising is under center? You, you mentioned it's not it's not four vert, spread the ball out uh, necessarily, but the efficiency was there. You talk about 37, 38 points a game. That that's a that's a top line offense right there, uh, and and you don't usually see that unless it is with that kind of scheme that is known for putting up that many points. So, what does this team look like when? when they're firing on all cylinders and number seven is under center. Definitely want to establish the run. Even with Cam rising there, it's a big thing for this Utah team. And they're a zone-heavy scheme. I'm, I'm very curious. The offensive line is the biggest question I have for Utah. They have high recruits. They have players I think that will gel, but there's just more proven commodities at other spots. So I expect them to still have that success establishing the run. But that's the first thing they want to do. And then once they can establish the run, that's where the play-action pass game gets going. And because you're so used to Utah running it, once they hit you with that play-action, it's like, oh, wait, they're actually throwing it. Utah also loves to attack the middle of the field because what do they have in the past, and well, even this year, they have had some of the best tight ends in the country. Dalton Kincaid is at a solid rookie season with the Bills. I think he's going to be a superstar. He was a superstar at the collegiate level. Like I said, with Brant Keithy, he's at two 600-yard receiving seasons, and that's rare for tight ends to have that type of production. So this Utah team loves to use the tight ends too. And then they have receivers that make a few plays each game. Now, what excites me is it just seems like Utah is good because of how many weapons this team has. And some of the questions I have with the running game, I think there's reasons to expect this offense to the ratio to be 50, 50, or I could even see like 55, 45 actually in favor of the pass this year because of how many talented guys they have that can win on the outside. I mentioned some of those proven commodities that had success at the power five level. And this tight end room is absolutely, I mean, just a, yeah. like, it's not just Brant Keithy. Carson Ryan was a starter at UCLA last year and Landon King. I only had 182 yards last year, but like just 
watched his, some of the catches and like even in practice, like that's just a guy I think is gonna is gonna expose. So the biggest thing with Utah is zone heavy run scheme, play action pass, but they're also going to air it out more this year because they have difference makers finally on the outside. And Cam Rising didn't come back just to play dink and dunk football. He's going to want to be aggressive. Utah's got the players to do it. I think this Utah offense has a chance to be special, and that's without me mentioning that that run defense only lost one player, and last year they were top five as a rushing defense. In The fr- the run defense is the front seven was mm-hmm. overall. They only lost one player from that front seven as a part of that top five run defense from a year ago. Oh, were they that good? I just didn't know if Baylor was just that bad at running the ball. <laughs> Probably a little bit of both. Probably a little, a little bit ball. of both. JT and I both agree. We love getting out to the ballpark in the summer. I was just at Fenway. I was actually just in Charlotte at the Charlotte Knights ballpark, which JT Wistersill now kind of calls home. It's a beautiful place to go. JT knows it. We like getting out to the ballpark. The only way to do it is through game time. Game time is the only place I go to buy tickets. You know why? Because I don't like a hassle. And neither does game time. They give you the ticket buying experience you need without the headache. They've got last minute deals, flash deals, zone deals going on throughout the week. It's the best place for last minute tickets where you can save up to 60% on the day of the game. I also love that they get the views from your seats in there. And my favorite part is the all in pricing. What you see in that price is what you are going to pay, not the hidden fees that you're seeing in all these other ticketing websites. And it's backed up by the lowest price guarantee or game time is going to credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying your MLB tickets this summer with game time. Download the game time app, create the account, use the code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code locked on college, L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Uh, but looking at the, the elephant in the room here, which is the schedule, uh, No doubt Utah is one of the strongest teams on paper in the conference. But I think what is leaning a lot of people towards picking them in it is the schedule to go along with that. And I'm looking at it now. We get the warm-up of Southern Utah, a good in-state rivalry, before taking on Baylor and then heading out to Logan. Ooh, grudge match there. At Oklahoma State is the end of September. That, I think, is the toughest road game on the schedule. Uh, Arizona at home, at Arizona State, TCU at home, at Houston, the big rivalry at home, uh, at Colorado, home at Iowa State, and at UCF. So, JT, I am picking, I have picked Utah unofficially on this podcast several times uh, to win the conference this year, mainly because of that schedule. Um, Again, no disrespect. We know it's a good team still, but with that schedule. So, why am I wrong in putting so much into the schedule? Or am I wrong? Is, is there something I'm missing here? It, it, is Utah just better than everyone else in the conference? I think that this Utah roster, in my opinion, is the best in the conference. But right. it's also just there's also really good teams. Like you could pick, you could say Kansas State has the best roster. You could say right. Oklahoma State has the best roster. There's other teams you could pick. I think Utah's the best, but I don't think it's clearly that Utah blows everyone out of the water. So if we got a lot of other good teams, what can we look for after? Well, how does the schedule set them up? Um, when we're talking about the top four teams in the Big 12, the consensus has been in Arizona sometimes gets roped in there, right? But the consensus often is in some order, Utah, Oklahoma state, Kansas state, and Kansas, Utah completely misses Kansas and Kansas state. Those are literally two. Any way you want to slice a top five teams. What's this Utah team also really good at? Cause this is where we can bring Arizona back into it. They're really good at home. Utah has lost one true home game since 2018 lost one in 2020 as well. Cause of the COVID year, that lone loss was last year to a Bo Nix. So you're a Heisman finalist was the one who went into rice Eccles stadium and diced Utah. Up. So it takes a special quarterback to be able to go in there and do it. It's just really hard to win. When you factor in the altitude, Utah stadium, isn't one of the largest capacity wise in the country, but the way it's structured, it traps in the sound. And also because of the altitude, even though these guys are in world-class shape, you get fatigued, you get tired. And what happens when you're fatigued and tired playing against athletes who are comfortable playing in that environment? It, it's not usually good things. So you'll see teams that maybe after the first quarter, like Utah got off to a slow start, but then, uh-oh, why is there? Why is the defensive line for the other team starting to wear it down? Oh, offensive line keeps false starting because, you know, when you're getting fatigued, it usually happens to the big guys first. <laughs> so that's something that we see a lot. So this home field advantage is really good for Utah. Utah has one game on their schedule they shouldn't be favored in, in my opinion, and it's at Oklahoma State. 
And I actually, and I like some of the things about the Oklahoma State matchup for Utah too, in terms of what did I mention? That run defense Mm -hmm. that Utah has is incredibly impressive. Ollie Gordon's really good, but when you pack the box, it get it gets tough sometimes, and I just think this make Alan Bowman team, beat you. Oof. Ex- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that could be that's, good for the Utes. Exactly. So yes, you, that's going to be a hard game for Utah to win. By far the most likely on their schedule, they lose. But there are things about that game where I'm like, okay, I feel good about that matchup. I feel better about that matchup on paper of okay, we can slow down Ollie Gordon than I do with Utah cornerbacks that I think can be good, but that have to hang with Shador Sanders, who might mm. may have who's going to be able to place those balls in elite positions to talented receivers. Utah should beat Colorado. They're clearly a better team, but like that's a matchup where I'm like, ooh, I don't like that matchup as much as I'm like, okay, I feel better about that Utah front seven going against Ollie Gordon. But after Oklahoma State, what's the second toughest game on the schedule? Because I know Iowa State could be good, but I just told you how hard it is to win inside Rice Eccles yeah. Stadium. So maybe they could do it, but I- I've seen teams clearly better than them on paper that haven't been able to. So to me, the next toughest game is at UCF. I think anyone who says, like I say Utah 11-1 and has been my schedule prediction. And for some people who go, that's crazy. In 2019, they played zero ranked teams, and they only had one loss in the regular season. I expect Utah to play two to three ranked teams on this schedule based on when they play them. Mm-hmm. And because a lot of those games come, could come at home too, it's just I don't expect Utah to lose those. So I see three losses at most on this fully healthy Utah team like, that's what the potential is to me. And I definitely think there's a potential where they go 11 and one. I'm not saying undefeated because that's just too hard in today's era of college, college football, but this is a talented roster. They're well coached and they got a chance to make history in the big 12 this fall. And I, as much as I would love to disagree with you, JT, I think 11 and one's not crazy. I really, I really don't. And I know that that's been a point of contention with the, the schedule has with fan bases of some other teams at the top, like you mentioned, like a Kansas, a Kansas state and Oklahoma state. Uh, but look, that's just, that's the way it goes the way she goes. And one of the important games is obviously week two against Baylor at home, which you've reminded me is a very, very tough place for visitors to, to win. Um, I, we kind of talked about it earlier. It was such a weird matchup last year. N- neither team had their quarterback. It w- it was, You know, Utah was expected to be a top 10 team. Didn't quite work out that way. Baylor was supposed to be a halfway decent team, and it didn't work out that way. Uh, So looking at that matchup this year, is is there something, I don't want to say chip on the shoulder, but something to prove from a Utah standpoint of like, we we let this thing get too close last year. We're playing them at home. We're trying to make this a bloodbath. I think if I'm Utah... This isn't even as much about like last year's game. This is about, I know it's technically not their first conference game. This is our first conference game. Let's leave an impression. Let's really take it to the Bears. Let's prove we're one of the best teams in the conference. Let's prove why Rice Eccles Stadium is so hard to play out too. And, you know, players find things to motivate them, right? Like maybe there are some people who are like, I've seen some Baylor fans where I talk about like, hey, that game was close. And, you know, Baylor actually had some success running on Utah in the first half. But then in the second half, Utah made some adjustments and had some players start to kind of just play better too because what do we just talk about with why it's tough to play at Utah? It's a new environment. The Texas heat, the heat is something Utah's really struggled in. Look back on 2022, they played Florida. That was one of like, Anthony Richardson was fantastic in that game and Utah couldn't tackle him to save their lives because they were players were clearly fatigued mm. in the heat. And that was something that also took its toll on Utah. And sometimes last year is being fatigued in that heat. And that's where Utah lucks out this year too, is they don't have those games in like a, the crazy heat, right? Like that game at Oklahoma state on September 21st, it could be decently hot. Right. But then like you get into October at Arizona state, that's even a night game. So your next road game is yeah. at Houston on October 26th, like in Texas. That That's not that hot right. by that point in the season. So like that's, th- that's where Utah locks out there. But getting back to what we were talking about with Baylor, to me, this is an opportunity for Utah to make a statement early against a Big 12 opponent. Baylor's got some positive things, but there are obviously a number of questions, hence the difference in preseason media rankings. I think this is going to be a very tough game for Baylor to win. And for those of you, once again, that lo- listen to me and you're like, this guy's full of crap like it's not going to be that way we can at least we can at least go back to this Uh, we've seen where utah is they're pretty much unanimously on the top 15 of these top 25 rankings i I haven't seen baylor popping up on most of them like that's where i'm just saying it's going to be a very tough game for the bear (laughs) (laughs) look the teams that beat baylor also receive votes so 
there, there's clearly <laughs> some sort of effect. It's like war in baseball or something. I don't know. I need to give I need to give my people some hope here, JT. I, yeah. I know you know that. I need to I need to throw a bone here. So you've talked about the strengths of Utah. What is something in terms of this team that you're thinking like, oh, that's a question mark, or actually I don't really like this this position group, or or if a team does this against Utah, I don't feel great about it. So with Utah, I feel good about the state of all their positions. You feel better about some, right? Like obviously Cam rising. I feel really good about Cam. Questions about his health, sure, but feel good about Cam. Mention those receivers. I have questions about this offensive line. There are talented okay. players on there. There's good. There's a good coach in place. There have been NFL offensive linemen literally the last like two years in a row. Utah's had an offensive lineman drafted the NFL. So the development is good there. But the offensive line was a weakness last year. So it's like, okay, can some of these players improve in their new spots? Are these new players going to rise up? And they weren't a bad offensive line, but they weren't the standard. The prior two years in a row, Utah was in that top like final 15 for the Jim Moorhead Award. Last year, they were not, nor did they deserve to be based on their play. So questions about the offensive line, but talented players with good coaching Talented recruits. I expect it to be pretty good. The other one is the secondary. They lost Sione Vaki and Cole Bishop. But the problem, like with that one, for like me being overly concerned, is I think Maureen Scally and Sharif Shaw are two of the best coaches. If you look at Utah's, why do we feel good about Alabama and Georgia each year, regardless of who they lose? Because it's Alabama and Georgia, and they consistently bring in elite and great that elite helps, great yeah. players, right? That's Utah's secondary constantly put guys into the NFL. So I feel really good about the players in place. And I saw some of those guys play at an extremely high level when given an opportunity in the bowl game. So based on the history and of Utah's defensive backroom, I feel pretty confident that they're going to be good. I just have some questions about the offensive line because some of the guys last year, I was like, okay, you guys were solid, but in a roster that I think, as I said, is the best in the conference, I do not think this is one of the best offensive lines in the Big 12. And it's a qu it maybe would be tough. I think has a chance to be top five at the end of the year, but I don't okay. think based on right now that they, they should be there. And uh, games are won and lost in the trenches. So that is where I will say, especially early on in the season, as they're working out of communication, this is by far the first real test they will have faded because, as we mentioned, Southern Utah is not going to be. Last time Utah played Southern Utah, I think it was 73 to 10. So that wow. one isn't exactly going to be a good uh, a good barometer for how it's going to uh, shake yeah. out there. But this is But this is a Baylor team that, Look, is still has lots of pieces on it that are positives. But there is, of course, a chance that Baylor can come in and win inside Rice Echo Stadium. I, I just, it's just going to be really hard based on what we've seen in the past and what I've seen these talented Utah players do against a team in a position similar position to Baylor. But especially if Utah, I don't think they'll do this, but if they're reading the press clippings about how good they are and they come out flat, Baylor jumps on them early. That's where anything can happen, right? I mean, yeah, that's why we, that's why we roll the footballs out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I will say, I mean, for Baylor fans, I wish I could tell you the pass rush was great and was just going to blitz them all night against the suspect offensive line. Not the case, but but they do have some quick new linebackers out on the field there this year who I think could get to the passer, which I would be excited about. And the resurgence of the star position, hopefully, in this year will will bring some speed to the pass rush as well. And Baylor's going to be airing it out unlike they have the last few years. Now, that that might not take right away, but the benefit is there's not going to be a lot on tape right away. So if those corners aren't quite up to speed yet, there, there could be some big playability for Baylor, which seems crazy to say after the season they had last year that there's a big playability from this team, but I do believe in Daquan Finn and, and this offense that, that uh, Jake Spavadol will bring. Uh, I do need to ask about... Maybe not specifically that Baylor game, but yes, the Baylor game and throughout the season. You do have a former Bear on the team. Yep. And you you Baylor fans will not remember him in shoulder pads. Uh, you will remember him, you know, missing rebounds and dribbling the ball off his foot, but then playing great in the Big 12 Conference Tournament in Kansas City because that is former power forward Caleb Lohner, who is coming to play tight end for the Utes, which you've already said is a stacked uh, room, position room for them. But you said you have an update on our man Caleb Lohner. I do. Look, there, and we heard a little bit about Caleb in terms of the very first week. Cam Rising said, look, he's like he's a big target. He's got a great – like he could leap out the gym, so we're excited to get him rolling up here. And then this week, Joel Coles of the Deseret News, who's a site that covers Utah here, this is what he tweeted out on his X account. 
Tight end Caleb Lohner was the last player off the field to practice today, staying late while working with the jugs machine. Freddie Whittingham, Utah's tight end coach, praised his hands last week, and Lohner certainly looks the part of a football player in pads. 6'8 and a bulked up 250 pounds. That's some impressive measurements right there. Love to hear that he's staying on the field, working hard. There's just one big problem for Caleb Lohner. As I said earlier, I think this might be the best tight end room in the nation. And what have all those players done? Produced at the collegiate level, played this position for years, refined their played route the sport. running. Yeah. Yeah. That might be, I mean, that's just that the biggest too. thing to me. Like, <laughs> like, like just played. Like, it's just so hard to just drop in and do this. To me, this move for Caleb is more so getting himself trained and prepared to be an undrafted, to potentially lock, lock on as an undrafted free agent with an NFL team. I just don't see why he, like, against Southern Utah, sure, he might play late, but there's just so many good tight ends this Utah team has. I, I just don't see a position where you're going to pick it up that quickly. I think Loner will contribute more on the basketball court than he will on the football gotcha. field. That's my personal feel on this whole situation. I would love it if he broke through. Like, good for him. He worked hard. A quick, funny story on Caleb Lohner. When I was a student at Utah in, like, 2019, I want to say, I think mm -hmm. it was my sophomore year I was up there, I passed Caleb Lohner on his visit when we all thought he was, like, going to become a Ute, and then he actually – went to BYU instead and then then went to join you guys at Baylor like that. So it's funny that he made his way back to Utah, but I'm excited to see just how – I love a guy with potential, so maybe he breaks through and plays. I just think it's really hard because Utah has – Definitely two guys who've gone over 200 yards receiving. Another guy in Landon King, who I told you I was high on, and literally mm -hmm. has been torching some of Utah's cornerbacks. And I don't think it's because those cornerbacks are poor. I think it's just how good Landon King is. So I just don't. And even Dallin Bentley is like, that's the fourth string guy. Utah's their blocking tenant. I have a hard time seeing the path for Caleb Lohner to play meaningful snaps on a Utah football team that is, for a reason, projected inside the top 15. But it's a fun story, and if he can make <laughs> it out of the – and I don't doubt his work ethic, right? He's still a Division sure. One athlete, so I'm yeah. sure he's putting in the time, but it, it's going to be really hard for him to get out there. I almost, I almost feel bad for him in that, like you mentioned, I mean, almost any other place in the Big 12, he's higher up on the depth chart or has more yeah. of a chance to play at that position. And he's 6'8", man, you know, little sneak – on a, on a red zone uh -huh. play, a goal to go situation. It's almost unstoppable, but yes. uh, you've got NFL tight ends ahead of them. So uh, that might be tough. Before I get you out of here, JT, I've got plenty of everydayers that do the road trips and don't take any offense to this. They loved going to BYU a few years ago. I think that's just because they love the state of Utah in general. We all flew into Salt Lake. So we, we love that too. So I know there's going to be some people that listen every day that are out there at Rice Eccles in, in September. I went to a killer Chili's there, but let me know some of your recommendations, may, maybe a food spot before or after the game, probably a night game. So before the game, where would you have them go? It's a great, unfortunately with the way Utah's campus is structured, it's like on, it's uphill. Like it's on the side of them. Yes, they, yeah, they, it's it's, hill. Like, yeah, it's uphill. It's called, um, it's mountains, it's mountains. It's gorgeous stadium, but there's not a lot of like places on campus, but um, oh, I'm trying to figure out where. I mean, the pie is really good. That's a pizza shop that I really like a lot out there too. Um, oh, that the burger place I'm thinking of is not close by the stadium, so I'm they just going like to anyway. What would you say? They might like that anyway. Venturing uh, out, Cotton Bottom, Cotton Bottom Burger. Cotton bottom. It's a little burger right. joint. I think that is fantastic too. Oh, there's a Hawaiian barbecue place. That's I, I really like Hawaiian barbecue, so I would highly recommend finding okay. a Hawaiian barbecue place. Uh, I think it's LL barbecue or something like that. But uh, look, it's a great place to watch a game because of the mountains. Utah is a beautiful state, so I'd highly recommend all of you guys, if you can, to make it out there like that. And hopefully the Bears can prove me wrong, and it's an entertaining showcase for Baylor. But either way, I hope you guys enjoy those of you who will be making the trip out to Salt Lake City. It really is a fun state. Oh, man, I would love to get out there again. I'll probably end up at Chili's, but Hawaiian barbecue sounds good. <laughs> we Texas, we'll, we'll, we'll try other barbecues. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll say Texas is better, but you, we'll hey, try other I'm, barbecues. I will say to, to redeem myself with your listeners a little bit, I played my high school football in Texas, so I do think Texas is the best high school football state, and I think Texas has the best barbecue as well. You're darn right, man. You, do you want to <laughs> share where you played so people can – you might have some. I played at Wakeland, Wakeland, Wakeland High Wakeland, School. All right, man. So I actually had a running one of my the running back my senior year, Colby Delashaw. I think he walked on 
at uh, Baylor as well, too, like that. So shout out Colby, wherever you are. But uh, yeah, played a little bit out there. Never got to play. Uh, and any we had, our, my team was fine, sense. not too crazy, so didn't get to play in the major venues. But uh, yeah, I did play my high school football in Texas, so and I think Texas is the best high school football state too. So yes, I'm looking forward Correct to eventually answer. getting out to Texas. I didn't get a chance to go to Baylor last year, but I'm excited to see these new rivalries in the Big 12 crafted, and would love to make it out there in the near future. So I am a big Texas fan in general, just of the state itself. All right. Yeah. Not a university of, but yes, I nope. get you. I get Horns you. down here, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Always. And forever. It's at JT Wistersill on Twitter X, um, and locked on Utes on Utah or on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. So at least I could send them your way. If, and when Utah loses a game, they can throw some of the receipts back at you. Cause a view is a view and a comment is a comment. So, uh, JT, they could follow you there, right? Did I get that right? Yep, you got it all right. And, hey, I've talked a lot about what I think this Utah team is capable of, and if they don't live up to it, I deserve it. So <laughs> feel free to clip these, send them my way. How about this, JT? What happened here? What happened here? So I love this time of year, preseason. We're all making predictions. The season's almost here. I can't wait to get it rolling. Utah's in the Big 12. It's going to be a fantastic football season. Cam, it was great jumping on with you. Thanks for, for being on with me, JT. Really appreciate it. Special thanks to you. We look forward to that game on September 7th. September 7th. We're Almost less than a month away. Actually, yes. the time we're releasing Ooh. this, it is a month away. Ooh. Yes. Yes. So give me a game prediction down in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe. You can follow us on Twitter at Locked on Baylor. Find us here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Thank you again to JT. And until next time, this has been your favorite show, Locked on 